Hello, one and all, and welcome to the American Patriots channel. Glad to have you here today. Now today, we're going to be talking about a sobering topic, and that topic is gun violence in America. The Declaration of Independence says that we have a right to life. So what I say is this, because of that, it is the duty of the government and all Americans to do their part to reduce gun violence, thus upholding our right to life. This includes supporting policing and working to prevent those who are unfit from possessing a firearm. Today we will explore effective common sense methods to reduce gun violence while upholding the rights, the Second Amendment rights, of law-abiding gun owners. What does the Second Amendment have to say about gun ownership? It says this, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, before we go on, I want to look closely at two of the words in the Second Amendment so that we fully understand what it's saying. The first word is people. It says the people can keep and bear arms. So does that mean that everyone can have a gun? Well, what about a five-year-old? Well, of course, a five-year-old is too young to possess a firearm. So there's an exception right there. It doesn't mean all the people. And another example, what about a person who's been convicted of murder? Are they allowed to possess a firearm? Well, there's federal law that says no, they are not. So clearly, there are exceptions when it says the people. There are some people that are not fit to keep and bear arms. The other word I wanted to discuss in the Second Amendment is arms. Does that mean that any sort of weapon is okay for a person to possess? Can I have, for example, a bazooka <laughs> or a machine gun? Well, of course not. Those, those are too extreme and they're not suitable for citizens to own and possess. Those are for the military. So there again, there are exceptions to that too. Not all the people have the right to keep and bear arms, and not all arms are appropriate for citizens to own and keep. All right, well, let's move on then, and let's have a problem statement. What is the problem in terms of gun violence in America? And the problem is very simple. About 35,000 people a year die because of gun violence in our country, give or take a little, but it's around 35,000. Let's take a look at how that compares with other countries. This bar chart demonstrates the gun-related death rates in several high-income countries throughout the world. The length of the bar indicates deaths per 100,000 population, and the data comes from the year 2010. Now, the death rates haven't changed too much since then. They're pretty consistent. So this represents what's going on today as well. The red bars show the homicide rate and the blue bars show the suicide rate. You might be surprised that in essentially almost every country the suicide rate is much higher than the homicide rate. Not only that, we can clearly see that the United States has much higher rates of both than any other country in the entire world. We have far more suicides and homicides per 100,000 population than anyone else. And this, in effect, is our problem. We need to correct this and get those rates down so that we can be more like some of these other countries. 
All right, so we need to take steps to significantly decrease the gun violence in our country. As I said before, we will employ effective common sense methods to do so. And the first area that we need to look at is poverty. Where there's poverty, there's crime. And where there's crime, there's gun violence. If we reduce poverty, we reduce gun violence. Gun violence is most commonly found in poor urban areas. Statistics prove this out and frequently is associated with gang violence. And it often involves young males. On this channel, we've already addressed many of the things that we need to do in order to reduce poverty. First of all, we need to have our children get a really good education to stay in school. That way, when they get out of school, they can get a well-paying job and afford to not live in a poor area. They can live in a more affluent area where there's less crime. And then their children will not be exposed to all the crime and gangs and drugs that would be associated with the poorer urban area. Beyond that, we need to have a strong family structure where our children have a mother and a father. That way, in effect, we're replacing all these bad influences of the poor urban area, the gangs and the drugs, with the good influence of the parents, the mother and the father. Our children need all of that. If we do that, we will reduce poverty. And associated with that, we will reduce gun violence and crime. That's a win-win all the way. But we need to follow those steps. Education, good job, strong family. And then our government can help too. And we've talked about this in an earlier episode. Our government can work towards reducing economic inequality. And what we suggested there was that we have a national union so that workers can work towards getting better pay and better benefits. They have a voice in the workplace. And also, we think that our government should revise the tax structure so that taxes are levied based on ability to pay. Right now, it's not very much fair like that. Instead, some more wealthy, high-income families are not paying their fair share. So if we do all those things, we've done a, come a long way in reducing gun violence due to poverty and reducing poverty along the way. The other main area, and there again, we're going for the heavy hitters now. We're going for the areas where we can make the most difference is we have too much easy access to guns. And we've already looked at it and seen where there's some people that shouldn't have a gun. There's a lot of guns in America. You wouldn't believe how many. Well, let's take a look and see just how many are in America. I'll, I'll give you a hint uh, as far as comparing us to other countries. Right now, civilians, so this is not the police, not the military, civilians have 393 million guns. That's more than one gun for every man, woman, and child in the entire country. Well, let's see how that compares with other countries. <laughs> All right, countries and territories with the highest number of civilian firearms per 100 residents. And there again, the United States stands out. We have far more guns in our country per person than anyone else. Folks, we have a lot of guns in our country. Almost 400 million. So what are we going to do to limit access to all these guns to make sure they don't fall into the wrong hands? Well, some other countries do what's called a buyback program. Their government offers money to all of these gun owners to sell the gun to them and then the government goes ahead and destroys the weapons. That way they reduce the number in circulation. 
Well, let's say we did that in America. If we bought back half the guns, that would still leave 200 million. We'd have more guns per person still than any other country in the world, and it would be really expensive. It would cost hundreds of billions, that's billions with a B, in order to buy back all those guns. Remember what I said earlier, which is we're looking for an effective method to reduce gun violence. Now, I'm not knocking a buyback program. It has some benefit, but I really don't think that that's going to do the job in our country. We need to look for something else to limit access to all these guns. What I suggest is that we institute a firearm owner's license. It would be similar to a driver's license. You get a little card with your picture on it, and that card could be used to purchase not only guns, but ammunition. There again, if you don't have the card, then you are not allowed to purchase either guns or ammunition. This card would have to be used not only if you go to a, gun, a regular uh, gun dealer, but also for private sales. Right now, if I wanted to buy a gun from my neighbor, I could go right down there and buy the gun with nothing, no license, no background check, nothing at all. In order to get this license, a person would have to go through a background check, kind of similar to what we do now. It would include a criminal history, but it would also include something new that I suggest, and that is a mental health evaluation. Now you might say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What's this about a mental health evaluation? Well, remember, we saw the statistics that showed that most deaths due to firearms are from suicide. It's really necessary to not only check and see if someone is a criminal before we let them purchase guns and ammunition, but also if we could at all possibly prevent someone from committing suicide because they have mental health issues, then this mental health evaluation would aid in doing so. I think it's very much worthwhile. Now there again, this whole problem is not going to solve itself. What I'm proposing is going to take a little bit of effort, and it's probably going to cost a little bit too. I don't think that the firearm owner's license would be free, nor the background check. I think there'd be, there would be a fee, but I think it's absolutely necessary in order to slow down this epidemic of gun violence and gun deaths. Now there are two, to speaking of this firearm owner's license, it would need to be reissued periodically. If a person has a squeaky clean record today, but then commits a crime, we'd want to catch that and not let them keep their firearm owner's license. So every so often they'd have to just have another background check before it's reissued. And that, that process of reissuing, I think, would be streamlined, not quite as involved as the initial application. And there, too, we could use this to help keep uh, youngsters from buying guns, too. The, the uh, license would only be issued to those 18 years of age and older, and those 18 years of age could buy long guns, like rifles and shotguns, like they can now under law, uh, but then they'd have to reach the age of 21 before they could purchase a handgun. So. Firearm owner's license. I, I think it's a really good idea. In addition, we need a waiting period for all gun purchases, whether they're private purchases or through a dealer. And why do that? Well, there again, there's that suicide rate. If there's a way, any way, that we can allow a person to have an opportunity to seek help instead of just running out and buying a gun and harming themselves, I think it's absolutely worth it. Just a few days and maybe, just maybe, they would instead change their mind and go and get some help. In addition to all of this, a lot of guns fall into the wrong hands because they're stolen. Someone breaks into a car or a truck or someone breaks into a home and they get their hands on the gun and obviously the person breaking in is a criminal. What do you think they're going to do with that gun? Well, they're not going to go hunting with it, I can tell you that. They're going to use it to harm other people, most likely. 
what we need there is we need to have some some requirements on how to store your firearms lock them up use a gun safe or a trigger lock now a lot of people have a gun in their home for self-protection and to protect their family and they're saying well hey I need quick access in case someone breaks in while I'm at home there are gun safes that allow for quick access too so that would not be an impediment to keeping that gun safe. Uh, just a little bit ago, I saw a news story where a 12-year-old girl, and I, I'm thinking it might have been in Idaho, I don't remember for sure, 12-year-old girl took a gun to school and used it on some of her classmates. I'll bet you she got that gun from home. So that's a great example of why we need to lock our guns up to keep them away from our children so they don't play with them. They, they think they're toys a lot of times and they hurt themselves or their friends and keep them out of the hands of criminals who'll break in. And there too, the, in your vehicle, same way. A lot of times criminals get guns from vehicles so they need to be secured in there as well. Now, once in a while we hear a story, a news story, where someone makes a threat. For example, there's some workplace violence that goes on. They might go in there and say, if you fire me, I'm going to shoot this place up. We need some common sense laws to handle a situation like that. So if someone makes threats, then we need to seize their firearms. That's just common sense. It makes perfect sense. It's sort of like a restraining order. Although in this case, you might call it a firearm restraining order. A court would be involved, and if there's a preponderance of evidence that an individual is indicating that they may commit violent acts, then the court would order that they temporarily, not permanently, but temporarily, seize the weapons from that person so that they can't hurt anybody with them, and then work through the process to resolve the issue. I think a lot of violence would be prevented from that as well. All right, so that's what we need to do in order to reduce access to firearms to allow people who are lawful, law-abiding law citizens to have access. They can purchase whatever they like, but try hard to limit access to only them and not those who are unfit, which would be those who have criminal backgrounds, felons, and so on, and also those who are mentally unstable for one reason or another. And that way we can, we can drastically reduce, in my opinion, not only homicides, but suicides as well. And there again, I said that this isn't going to be easy. It's going to take a little effort on all our parts. We're going to have to go through some processes there. So it's worth it though. Remember, how many people die every year due to gun violence? Around 35,000. What if we could reduce that number by 10,000 per year? Now, how would you like to be a hero? Those of you out there who own guns or who want to purchase guns or ammunition, if you go through this process, I think we could say, let's say maybe 10,000 lives a year. Those are 30 people every day on average that would still be alive. Every day, 30 extra people. And 30 extra families that wouldn't have to suffer the loss of a loved one. Imagine that. A hero is a person that goes out and saves a life. And in going through the process of restricting guns to only those who, who should have them, we can do exactly that. We, Amer us Americans, could be heroes because we would be saving countless lives every year. Yeah. All right. Now, since these things make a lot of sense, uh, you know, we talked about a firearm owner's license, uh, laws to uh, for private sales, to make sure we have the background check there too, uh, to lock up guns and so on and so forth, then why haven't we done those already? What's the problem? Why haven't our politicians fixed this thing already? America is a laughing stock. You saw how many 
deaths we have due to guns every year, we far exceed every country in the world. They think that we're out of our minds to, to continue this on and on. Well, this disgusts me because our politicians have needed to take action on this long ago. And yet, what are they doing? Well, one thing they're doing is they're saying, hey, let's ban assault weapons in high capacity magazines. That'll save a lot of lives. There again, it's got to be effective. Assault weapons and high capacity magazines were banned in 1994. And that ban stayed in effect for 10 years. What did it do? Well, studies show that it had very little effect on the number of homicides due to guns. It sounded good, it felt good. Our politicians fooled us into thinking they were really doing something important and something worthwhile, and yet they were not. So, politicians, get on it. What is your problem? Not only that, though, there's another reason why we're sitting here and not doing anything about this. And that is that there are a lot of extreme viewpoints out there about guns. When you have extreme viewpoints, that leaves little room for a middle ground. And what am I talking about there? Well, there's what I'll call the NRA viewpoint. The NRA wants as little gun regulation as possible. Now, they have a reason for that, though. They are afraid that if we have more and more regulation, eventually we will lose our ability to own firearms. There'll be people out there that'll say, hey, we need to take the guns. We need to get rid of all these guns in our country because they are doing all this harm. So the NRA has a point there that there are the other side of the coin, the other extreme, people who want to eliminate all guns when you're saying little regulation and the other, on the other hand you're saying let's get the guns well where's the middle ground where are the compromises that we need to enact the exact things that I've talked about today there is very little room for that middle ground so what I say to those of you who say let's not accept any new regulation stop it just stop and relax a little bit and be prepared to compromise. And for those of you out there who say, we need to eliminate all guns in our country, I say stop it to you too. Those guns are not being used to harm people when they're in the right hands. And besides, we have a constitutional right to keep and bear arms, but only those who are fit. Let's try to change it so that the, those who are fit can have what they want in terms of firearms and those who are not not. Simple as that. Let's compromise, please. If we do so, we will save all those lives that I've been talking about. 35,000 of them are potentially savable every year, and how, who knows how many of those we can cut, the, how, how many of those will, would be living today if we'd only go ahead and act some new laws, new restrictions to prevent gun violence. All right, so that's all I have for today. Next time, I'm going to talk about social welfare. Social welfare is a great thing. It's like a safety net, and it's there for all of us. But it needs to be treated very carefully, because it can do some harm, too, if we're not careful. At the same time, I think that we can improve our social welfare program. And I'll give you just a little a little tidbit, a little hint as to what I'm talking about. I think that we should extend Medicare down to those who at age 60. Right now it's available once you reach age 65. I think that we can, we can afford to extend it down to age 60 and Social Security, retirement Social Security, is available down to age 62. Let's reduce that age down to 62. So when a person reaches age 60, they can start Medicare and they can start Social Security if they wish. 
wouldn't that be great? And there are, there's a way to afford it too. It's not just a big cash outlay there. I'll explain all of that right here next time on the American Patriots channel. I know you're going to want to tune in because it's going to be beneficial to all of us to look at how we can improve the social welfare programs in our country. All right. God bless you and God bless our country. See you next time.